Amen, and you may be seated. I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, as we're going to dig into verses 1 through 11, and we're going to focus on one prophetic word that is listed there from Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. And today, I want you to begin to think about this as we head towards the Easter event. I want you to think about the blessed dawn. The blessed dawn. You know, we go through a we go through a lot of night at times in our life, don't we? We hit those valleys when everything seems dark and there's despair all around us and we feel overwhelmed. And there are those challenges. But the Bible tells us that the path of the righteous, the path of the righteous is like the, the breaking of dawn that gets brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. And so I want you to think about that, that God has given us a promise. He's given us a promise that our path will get brighter and brighter to the very fullness of day. You know, when you first get married, you don't know much. You ever notice that, guys? You think you know it all, but you don't. But I've learned I don't know anything. Beverly and I are celebrating today 34 years of marriage. And then our oldest son is having his 28th birthday today as well. I mean, he came and messed things up. But uh, I remember that Sunday in which he was born. We sat at the hospital uh, through Saturday night, throughout the day Sunday, and into Sunday night. Man, that kid was slow. But whatever, things get brighter, and life gets brighter. And I want you to grab a hold of that because that's God's promise, is that the path will get brighter and brighter to the fullness of day. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, these are the words that we read. We read that the Lord Jesus Christ, that when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, uh, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and they will send them at once. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, that's the prophet Zechariah, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went, and they did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and they put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road. And the crowds, they went before him, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. And they were saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And so today we come to that time of the year we know on the Christian calendar as being Palm Sunday. And I was thinking about the path of the righteous because what we discover as we dig into, into the life of Jesus Christ is he's righteous, he's altogether righteous. The path grows brighter and brighter to the fullness of day. And, and it looks kind of bright right here on Palm Sunday. I mean, Jesus is entering Jerusalem. People are excited. He's mounted the colt, the foal of a donkey. He's riding on the cloaks of his disciples. On the road, there are strong cloaks out on the road, and there are the palm branches lying there. And people are declaring, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, in the very highest. And so the message of Palm Sunday is really the message of the King. And one of the things that we have to grab a hold of in life is, you know, we're not the best people to be in charge. Have you ever noticed that? We are not the best people to be in charge. How many of you, when you've been in charge, have made a mistake? That's what I thought. All across the room. We all make up, mess up. We all have mistakes. And, and the message of Palm Sunday is about the king, the king who never makes mistakes. 
And, and so he comes and he's offering himself on this Palm Sunday to the nation of Israel, but the nation of Israel will, re, uh, will reject him, so much so that he sits upon the mountain in Matthew chapter 23 and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and that stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? See, your house is left desolate. And in AD 70, if you remember your history lessons, Jerusalem did fall, and it was destroyed, and it was left desolate. And beyond that, the Lord Jesus not only entered you know, through the gates of the city, but he came to this place called the temple. The very place where the Lord God Almighty is supposed to be worshipped. And in the temple, what he finds is not those who are worshipping and not those who are exalting and bowing before him as king, but those who are rejecting him. And even beyond that, those who are robbing from him. He said in Matthew 21, 13, it's written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of robbers. You've made it into a robber's den. And so there's a couple things I want us to think about as we think about this text. In that crowd that day as Jesus came into Jerusalem, then as he went on to the temple, there were all kinds of different people. There were religious people. There were religious people that from every appearance on the outside, they had it all together. There were people that were just pure out excited about Jesus coming to town. Maybe they were not quite as religious as some of those religious people because what we find out about many of those religious people, they weren't too excited about it. It was going to mess things up for them. There were people that were following him. It seemed like a high moment. It seemed like a bright moment. The path of the righteous, you know, it gets brighter and brighter. It seems like a bright moment. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, they're looking to Jesus as, as, as a descendant of David. They're expecting him to rise up on a throne and, and rule over a, a, a temporary kingdom over earth. But that's not what Jesus came for. Jesus came to rule over an eternal kingdom. And, and so as they would approach the cross on Friday, you'd see a turn that, that happened among the people, those that didn't follow all the way through and those that turned code and, and, and screamed out to crucify him and only a few that would follow all the way to the cross and to the tomb. And I want you to think about this, that God, as he marches into our lives, He's called each and every single one of us to be the temple of his presence. And he will never be satisfied until he rules and as he reigns as the undisputed and the unrivaled king of our life. In the book of Zechariah in chapter 9 verse 9 from which the, the, uh, my, the uh, Matthew quote comes. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And when you consider Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, there are three things that stand out right there about the kind of king that Jesus is. Now, when you and I think about a king, we might think about a trip to London and, and taking a, a journey, you know, through the museums of London and, and going there uh, to the Tower of London and looking at the crown jewels. Man, those things are awesome. And, and they're stately. And they're indescribable. And they're cool to look at. And they're worth billions of dollars. And certainly that ascribes majesty in one sense. Done a little traveling over the past week. Last weekend we were away, as many of you know, and uh, one of our former church members had passed away, and we went to that funeral. And, uh, and then I did a crazy thing because the funeral was in Orlando. I turned around and went back Wednesday because I'd promised the girls that I'd take them to Universal and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we did Universal. My Fitbit, I did over 20, nearly 21,000 steps that day in Universal. 
And then I did almost the same thing shopping on Friday. But as they were shopping, you know, I'm kind of looking around. I mean, you know, there's certain things in stores I have no interest in. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking through the window of the Omega Watch store. You, anybody like Omegas? You know, they're, they're pretty nice watches. And then I looked at the Rolexes. I'm just looking through the window. I don't go in the room because there's no way I'm going to get one, right? But I, I'm just kind of looking. And, and I overhear these two guys carrying on. And this one guy's carrying on because he's disgusted with his attorney who I, I guess is uh, representing him in a, in a divorce case. And he says, well, all I do is give the guy money, and, and he drives a Maserati like he's some kind of a king. And so, you know, we might associate, well, if you drive a Maserati, you can be a king. You know, we have all these associations about what a, a king looks like. But the kind of king that Jesus is sets him apart from every other king that's ever been born upon this planet. The Bible tells us here in Zechariah 9, 9, that this king, King Jesus, is a righteous king, and he is a humble king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and humble. These are the two most powerful words concerning the majesty of, of, of Jesus Christ as king. He's righteous and he's humble. And you know, we live in a world... That, that yearns for, that thirsts after, that, that hungers after righteousness. We long for, for justice. You know, and, 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 and what we have to understand is justice and righteousness will only be enacted when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns as the king of the universe. This past week, we had what we know here in the United States as Super Tuesday. We all went to the polls. And, you know, you're wondering, well, who am I going to vote for? And all those different kinds of things. And you hear all this debating going back and forth among the presidential candidates. And then you hear the inside stories about how one party's trying to oust uh, somebody in their group, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and the kind of president we need. Listen, we don't necessarily need a president. What we need is a king. We need the King Jesus to rule and to reign undisputedly and unrivaled in our hearts and in our lives. We need Jesus more and more. And so the Bible says that one day he's going to rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As a matter of fact, in the, gospel, in the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, the Bible declares to us that a child would be born, a son would be given, a government would be upon his shoulder, and his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there'd be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, the righteousness of King Jesus. And so you, you take Jesus and you measure Jesus against any other person who's ever lived on this earth, and there's no one, no one who measures up. And then another word that stands out besides righteous is this word humble. You know, you don't think of those who are sovereign, right, being necessarily humble. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is humble. He is humble. And, and so the genius of this greatness in the Lord Jesus Christ is his ability to condescend. Now, Matt questioned me on that word. I, I send to Matt a copy of what I'm doing as he's preparing music so that we kind of try to jive things together, right? And, uh, and so he looked up condescend to, to look it up in the English. He said, well, you are using it in the right way. Because, you see, the problem is in our American English at times, we don't always use words in the correct way. And so, you know, when we think of someone being condescending, we think of them, you know, kind of like insulting us, you know, knocking us. But condescending for Jesus means that he lowers himself. He, he himself comes down. And, and, and so, you know, man may aspire, and that's what we all do. We all want to rise up. We, you know, we, we want to be greater than, than the guy before us. 
And we want to set a record that's going to hold for a while. We, we want to be at the very top of our game. We want to succeed. Man may aspire, but only God condescends. Only God, the creator of all things, the, the sustainer of all things, the, the lover of us, he comes down to where we are. And so the greatest moment in all of history is when God condescended, so to speak, when he, think about this, the God who spoke the universe into being, the God who made every cell work that's in our body, the God who made this marvelous design of creation, when he condescended, when he contracted to the measure of a woman's womb. That's pretty Big deal, conden, uh, you know, condescension. And the eternal one that knew no limits of time was born in time. And when men looked into the face of God, this lowly one wrapped in these swaddling clothes in the manger, there was a wonder of wonders because this one, born of woman, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in the manger, he was born king. Think about that. Men are not born as kings. Men may be born as a prince, but they are not born as king. When Jesus was born, he was born as king. He was the lowly one, but today, what we see on this Palm Sunday is we see him in his majesty. And there's been no potentate, no monarch, no head of state, no president that has ever lifted our eyes to such a holiness or bring our eyes down to such a lowliness as Jesus Christ, the, the one who is fully God and the one who's fully man. As a matter of fact, in the book of Philippians, Paul writes on this doctrine and he says in the second chapter, that he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Jesus Christ is a majestic king. He's a majestic king because he has come and because he leads us to a place to better our lives. So Jesus is leading. Think about this, as Zechariah wrote. He said, your king is coming to you mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Not only did riding a donkey portray lowliness and humility, it was also a sign of peace as he entered into Jerusalem. And from Matthew's point of view, what he sees in the Lord Jesus Christ is he sees one who's able to lead and master all of creation. He is King Jesus. He's the master of the universe. He's the master of creation. He's the, he's the master of the winds and the waves, and, and he masters even the animal creation. If you'll remember, he spoke to a stormy sea and said, peace be still, and it immediately became quiet. He spoke demons into a, a herd of swine who cast themselves into the lake. And what we learn from this is the Lord Jesus Christ wants to lead you and me in our lives. And certainly we need him to lead us because as we all agreed a while ago, we've all fouled up, we've all made mistakes, we've all been misled at times. Just think about how Jesus took control of the cold. In Matthew 21, he said, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he, and he will send them at once. You know, there is no indecision in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we get indecisive, do we not? Like today, when we get done with church, where do you want to eat? I don't know, where do you want to eat? Well, you decide. No, you decide. Does that conversation ever happen in your car after church? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And, and so we deal with that. You know, we get indecisive, but Jesus, you know, he's very decisive. He says, go and take the cold. And, and, and in that, you know, we have a, a beautiful picture of his claim, not only upon the creation, but he has a claim upon you and me. How can Jesus have a claim in your life? Well, number one, he made you. He made you. The Bible says in Psalm 100, he says, Know that the Lord, 
He is God. It's he who has made us, and we're his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So he made you. Number two, he bought you. The Bible declares in the book of 1 Corinthians that you are not, uh, you're not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Jesus Christ came to give you life. And number three, he wants you. He wants you. You're not the last pick. You're not the, the, the last one that, that he wants on his team. He wants you today. He wants you right now. He wants you to know him. He wants you to exalt him as the unrivaled and as the undisputed king of your life. You know, he wants to be able that when you submit to him as Lord and Savior, as these six did up here in the baptistry this morning, that, that you are submitting to his control. Lord, you know things better than I do. You know directions better than I do. You know the way better than I do. Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you. I'm dependent upon you that you will lead and that you will guide. And he has promised that the path of the righteous is like the blessed dawn that gets brighter and brighter until the very fullness of day. You know, Jesus taking control of that colt in itself is a miracle. Think about this. It takes about eight weeks to break a colt and another eight weeks or so to get one trained. And, and, and here he is riding that colt into Jerusalem. You know, I, I don't know an awful lot about horses, but I know a couple of, of wild stories of me on a horse. I went with my father-in-law one time to an auction, and we bought two horses. It was at night at this auction. The auction was held in a chicken house. Those of you from the south know what a chicken house is. It's a long barn that's low-topped, and they, uh, you know, they're auctioning off horses. So we went, and we looked at these horses, and he looked at their teeth and all that, and they seemed calm, and we bought them. And uh, loaded them in the back of a pickup truck with cattle rails on it. <laughs> Carried them to the pasture, got them out. Man... Those horses, after that doping they put on them, wore off. <laughs> Those things were wild, <laughs> uncontrollable. But Jesus mounts one that's never been mounted, and he rides it with control. The kids are singing. It's noisy. There's shouts. Palm branches are, are going back and forth. And you know, in your life, you, it's something like that. You know, you've got noise in your life. You've got noise all around. Wednesday, I did something crazy. I think I already said this, but I, I took the girls back down, and we went to Universal, and I got a phone call. And it was so loud. The music's blaring everywhere. And, and so I started checking it out. All around Universal Studios, there's noise. Did y'all know that? There's noise everywhere. And we've got all kinds of noise in our life. Sometimes that noise is saying, you're not worthy. Sometimes that noise is saying, you, you're worthless. Sometimes that noise says, nobody loves you. Sometimes that noise says, there's no hope. But let me remind you that God said in Psalm 4, or, or Proverbs 4, that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It's a blessed dawn. It shines brighter and brighter to the fullness of day. And he wants to break through the noise and, and take control in our life. And, and there's all kinds of distractions. The distractions of, of the palm branches waving. And you know, you don't go anywhere that there's not distractions. In the midst of all the noise, the distractions are trying to grab your attention and say, come here, go there, do this, enjoy that, live life. And then the kids are singing. And those of you that have kids, do you realize how busy your kids keep you through the seasons of life? I mean, just think about it. Pastor Dan told me this morning, he was sitting right there a second ago. He came in and said, my kids are sick. Well, he's got toddlers. You know, y'all remember that season? You know, runny noses and coughs and all that kind of stuff. Or your teenager? Anybody get kept up late last night by your teenager? Okay, there's a couple of hands. I identify. I've been there. 
you know, worry, concern, all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's all this kind of stuff, but God comes and he breaks in. He breaks into our lives and says, let me take control. Lay it at my feet. Trust me. I can help you. And then finally, I want you to see this about Jesus. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is not just right, just, and not just humble. And not only is he leading, but Jesus is serving as well. He serves as well. And, and I want you to look at what he serves up. In Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. And the literal translation of having salvation is he is bringing salvation. Jesus came into the world on purpose. He came into the world on purpose. And the purpose of his coming was to bring salvation. In bringing salvation, he showed us the greatest form of servanthood that, that you know, could ever be. You know, servanthood is not a real popular thing among us. We don't like to be servants. We like to be served. Last Saturday when Beverly and I were at the funeral of, of George Raslaff, we got into the church a few minutes early and we were in there waiting before they opened the doors of the, or their worship build area. And there's a lady doing stuff, and she comes up with a cart and says, Here, would you go put this up? It goes in the kitchen down that hall. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to be that servant. Have, do anybody identify here? I mean, this is not my church. I don't know my way around. I don't know you. You know, I don't want to do that. Maybe I don't ever do that, feel that way but why? This is me. And um, besides, I'm a pasta. Pastas aren't supposed to serve. No, that's not real. We're all supposed to serve. And so I, I reluctantly put it away. I'm just telling you the truth. I reluctantly did it. So the Lord's dealt with me about this service issue. I thought about this message all week long. You know, we're called to serve. And we need to be reminded that there's no place of service that is too low. I mean, think about how Jesus served us. He came all the way from heaven to earth. He took on a form like us. He experienced our pain. He went to a cross. He was buried in the grave. And on the third day, the grave could not contain him. He knows the lowliness of servanthood. And he calls us to be servants as well. And Jesus came to the world for the purpose to bring that salvation. And Paul wrote to Titus, he said, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. And Matthew penned in Matthew 1 that they should call his name Jesus, for he would save his people from their sin. And so the Lord Jesus stands outside the door of our hearts, of our lives, and he's waiting to bring us salvation. And when I look at the world that's all around me, I see a mess. I see that there, we have wars and we have rumors of wars and I see that there's killing and there's angst and there's all kinds of issues going on in the world all around us. What we need is we need salvation. Salvation from the penalty of sin. The Bible declares that Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am foremost. That's what Paul wrote. But I feel like I'm the foremost. He didn't know me. You know, I feel like I'm the chief of sinners. I mess it up. I, I blow it. And the Bible tells me that the wages of my sin is death. And everyone, uh, but everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And that was the testimony of those six people being baptized this morning as Pastor Ilio baptized. That each and every single one of them had called upon the name of the Lord. And he saves us from the power of sin. The Bible declares in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God and that being saved. 
I want you to grab a hold of this. It's not just a matter of coming to the front and saying, I confess Jesus and going to the baptistry and getting wet and being baptized in his name, but it's a continuing process. It's growing in the Lord. It's maturing in the Lord. It's becoming more in the Lord every day that my path may grow brighter and brighter unto the very fullness of day. And it's freedom ultimately from the presence of sin. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he came to die on the cross. In Hebrews 9, 28, the Bible says, Christ, having offered once to bear the sins of many, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin because sin is dealt with at the cross, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And then we'll be like him. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. We will be with him. And Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, understand. He said, understand the present time. That it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up from your slumber. Salvation is nearer today than it's ever been. The night is nearly over. The day is almost gone. Put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light and clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. For he wrote to the Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend. When Jesus comes back to gather us up, He's not going to send a representative. He's not going to send a plane from from somewhere to pick us up. But he himself is going to descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, with a shout like a trumpet of God. And the Bible says that the dead will be raised first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Yes, this path that we travel as we follow Jesus, it is like the breaking of dawn. It gets brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. You know, as I travel that path, there are deep and dark valleys that I go through. There are sometimes majestic peaks that I peer over. But nothing compares to the brightness of that full day when Jesus Christ comes back. The one who reigns in majesty through righteousness and humility. The one who reigns as leader as as he takes command and controls us in our lives. And the one who reigns in service as he brings salvation that deals with our past and our present and our future. Oh, what a king he is. And the path of the righteous... It's like the breaking of day. It's like the breaking of dawn that gets brighter and brighter to the fullness of day. Listen, if you don't know Christ Jesus as your personal Savior and your personal Lord, you're stumbling around in the darkness. You're fouling up. You're messing up. You're blowing it over and over again. But he came to turn the lights on. He came to help you to guide you, to lead you, to love you. He came to take you to the the next level, to a whole nother level. He came to lift you up. I want to ask you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, would you consider him? Remember I shared with you two weeks ago five unending truths. Truth number one that everybody needs to really have a hold of is this. What? Who remembers? Life is short. Life is short. My friend who died last week, he was only 68. Now, I know if you're 25, that may sound old. But listen, if you're 65, that doesn't sound old. But life is short. Number two, eternity is long. Eternity's long. Number three, sin is dark. It darkens us. It darkens our existence. And hell is for certain without Jesus Christ. But number five, heaven can be yours. For Jesus came to make your path the path of the righteous. Like the breaking of dawn to get brighter and brighter until the fullness of day. Would you give your heart to Christ today? Let's pray.
Our Father, we bow before you this morning and we thank you for your love and your tender mercies. And Lord, we ask you that in these moments that lie ahead of us, that our eternal decisions that lie in the balance would be made in such a way so as to honor Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're the majestic King of glory who comes in righteousness and in humility. We thank you, Lord, that you're the one who commands and controls our lives. And we thank you that you're the servant King who brought us salvation. Lord, do you be the glory in these moments ahead. For us in Christ we pray. Amen.